This episode today is quite personal to me, actually, because this is one of my favorite songs, and it's a song I use every day. I listen to this song every day. And while I listen to this song, I look at a picture of myself when I was younger. The song is Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes, and I think many people think that it's he's singing it to someone, but I don't think so. I think he's actually singing it to himself. There's two versions, one that's pre-recorded and one that's live. So the pre-recorded one is only about five minutes long, but the live one is about 11 and a half minutes long. And that's the one I typically listen to. And if you know my theory of anxiety, it's basically you and the child in you, the frightened child in you, aren't connected. You're disconnected. That child is by him or herself suffering, and the adult part of you is kind of ignoring them. It's not really paying attention to their alarm. So what happens is we, as adults, push away that childhood pain because that's where our alarm is. So it's a natural human response to push away pain. But unfortunately, when we push away pain, we're also pushing away the child in us who's technically, well, maybe that's not the right word, but is asking us for peace, to be seen, heard, loved, and protected. And what we're doing is we're pushing it away. And I've talked about this on podcasts before, but if you saw a child in a grocery store that came up to you that lost their parents and was holding their hands up like and crying, of course you would pick that child up. Of course you would comfort them. But for some reason, in our own bodies, when we feel that child in us with their hands up, like, pick me up, I need attention, you know, I'm crying, we don't do it. We don't do it. And that's one of the reasons I think that people suffer from anxiety as well as depression, eating disorders, personality disorders to some extent. A lot of it is childhood wounding that we don't want to go back to. And because we don't want to go back there, that child suffers in silence. And what I love about this song is I believe he's singing this song to his younger self. And I'm going to go through the lyrics and I'm going to show you my thought pattern when I hear these lyrics, and maybe they'll resonate with you too. And maybe you can start this practice as well, because I start every day with this practice. I have a little kind of younger self meditation that I've made for myself that I'm going to make for everybody, for you, soon, but I'm working out all the bugs right now. So what I want to do is make this younger self, inner child, whatever you want to call it, meditation for you, so that you can listen to this every morning, connect with that younger version of yourself, and perhaps have a picture of yourself too, and then listen to this song because it has a lot of meaning in it. And I like the live version more than the studio recorded version because he has some lyrics that he says up front that he doesn't say in the recorded version. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the lyrics and I'm gonna explain to you what these lyrics mean to me while I'm watching this. And often it will bring me to tears because I want to connect with that child. I want to connect with Rusty because he contains the best part of me. And when I was younger and he was bullied or he was suffering with issues with his father, I kind of judged him for being weak and abandoned him and blamed him and shamed him because I felt that he was hurting us, whoever us is. I felt he was the cause of the pain. When the cause of my pain was just this protective reflex of pushing away the pain, pushing the child in me away, judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming, what I call jabs, pushing that child in me away. And how we heal from chronic anxiety and probably depression and eating disorders and all these other things is reclaiming that child's experience, bringing that child back into belonging and showing them that they're seen, heard, protected, and loved. Giving them now what they probably didn't get. Well, undoubtedly they didn't get it when they were younger because that's what trauma does to our nervous system. Trauma is one of those things that we all experience it when we're younger. And I just did another Mel Robbins podcast that should be coming out in another probably four to six weeks, which is amazing, which is, it's so good. It's so good. 
But I think when we, we get into this thing with our younger selves, where we push them away, we push them away. And when we push them away, they do two things. They get louder. So the alarm gets more painful or they shut down. They go into dorsal vagal shutdown. If you know anything about polyvagal theory and they become non-responsive, they become dissociative. So when we are not connected to ourselves, not loving ourselves to use kind of like one of those woo terms, maybe loving yourself, it's an woo term, but it's getting better. We can't love anybody else because the machinery, the software that we're using to connect with other people is offline because we're in survival mode. When you're in survival mode, survival physiology, you create, you secrete cortisol, epinephrine, and your body goes into the survival mode and your prefrontal cortex and a lot of the premotor area, a lot of our, our predetermined pathways to connection gets shut off because from an evolutionary sense, we don't need to be loving and connected when we're running from a warring tribe or a saber-toothed tiger. You know, if you're in a cave and there's a tiger chasing you 60,000 years ago, you're not going to turn over to your, your buddy and say, hey, Bill, how's it going with the wife? You know, you're just trying to survive. So we go into this emotional part of our brain that doesn't allow us to connect. And I'll do another podcast on this about dissociation and about how we want to connect, like we truly want to connect with other people. But when we get into this anxious alarm state, the part of us, the human resonance circuitry, as Dr. Dan Siegel calls it, or the social engagement system, eye contact, tone of voice, positive voice, body language, facial expression, this stuff that's innate in us, is wired in us, gets shut off in favor of survival. So when we are in survival mode, we shut off the software in our brains that allow us to be connected. So the trick is bring yourself back into connection. And one of the things that I use to bring myself in connection is this song coming back full circle. And again, I like the live version. If I'm in a hurry, if I have to get up quickly, I will use the recorded version because I've done it so many times now it brings up the same emotions in me. So what I want to do is I want to go through the lyrics of this song and explain to you what goes on in my mind, what allows me to connect to that younger version of myself. So in the live version, he talks about the first thing he says is accepting all I've said and done, which is one of the things we don't do with our younger selves. We, we judge, abandon, blame, and shame them because they did something wrong. You know, they made a fool of themselves, they were embarrassing, they, they picked their nose in school, they were shy, as a boy they cried, like all these things that we do as children that we blame ourselves for as adults when we were just children when the things happened. So the first thing he says is accepting all I've done and said. And I think that's a brilliant start to the song because we're, that's what we have to do. We have to stop judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming, taking jabs at that child, because when we do that, we split from ourselves. And when we split from ourselves, we create a tremendous amount of alarm in ourselves. And that alarm is what originally causes our anxiety. The alarm in our body is read by our mind compulsively, because our mind is a compulsive, meaning-making, make-sense machine. And it compulsively reads the body. So if you've got this alarm in your body, what I call background alarm in my book, if you have this background alarm, your mind reads that and it says, hey, clearly you're feeling unsafe. And then the left hemisphere goes, what do we have to feel unsafe about, John? Well, open door number two, because there's always something we feel unsafe about, our health. Our, our engagement with our, our parents or our spouse or our kids. There's always something, taxes, dentists, there's always something that we're concerned about. So when we feel that way, when that alarm is in our system, our mind automatically looks for things that make sense of that horrible feeling of alarm. And then we believe those thoughts because we made them up. And then we start the alarm anxiety cycle. So the Alarm in our body is there first. Then the bad thoughts start, the worries, the warnings, the what ifs, the worst case scenarios. And then we believe them because we made them up. And then that makes the alarm worse, which of course makes the thoughts worse, which makes the alarm worse. And we get caught in this alarm anxiety cycle. And to heal, we have to break that cycle. We have to allow the alarm to be there. 
feel it to heal it, allow it to be there, allow it to feel it, and not compulsively and relentlessly add thoughts to it. Because as soon as we add thoughts, the feeling, we're in that cycle, and that cycle will never get out of it. You'll never get out of that cycle without recognizing what it is. So that was a long first first lyric. It's going to be a long podcast. Hopefully not. But anyway, accepting all I've done and said. So he's going back. He's looking in the eyes of the child, in his mind's eye. This is what I believe is happening. This is what I, this is what I want, want this to be about because this is what it's about for me. So looking back into the eyes of, of the child. And I have this picture of me. I don't know if this will pick this. I hope it picks this up because I don't have a monitor on my... But basically, that's me at three years old. And for those of you listening on the podcast, I'm holding up a picture of me when I'm about three years old. My mother took it when I'm holding on to the, oh, shut off there. My mother took it when I was holding on to my crib. So accepting all I've done and said, going back, not judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming the child, welcoming the child by looking in their eyes. In your, in your own mind's eye, can you picture the eyes of your child, even if it's painful? And I mean your child, the child in you, the child that is of you, you when you were younger. And then he says, after accepting all I've done and said, I want to stand and stare again, which is making this reconnection with this child that made mistakes in his, in his mind. And again, I'm reading a lot into this, but this is, this is what I feel carries the most weight for change for you. If you do this practice, you will connect with your younger self. And a little caveat here. I mean, if you've had severe emotional, physical, sexual abuse, this may not be the episode for you because I don't want to fire you back into that, that place. But we can all be more compassionate to that younger version of ourselves because that's how we heal. And if you've had severe emotional, physical, sexual abuse, that's the time to seek out a therapist. So accepting all I've done and said, Looking back, not judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming that child. Looking in their eyes, I want to stand and stare again. I want to be able to make that connection with you again. And you is the, this version of you, my younger self. Till there's nothing left out. So accepting all I've done and said, whatever you did as a child, whatever you thought, said, or did, is absolutely fine with me. A, you were a child. And B, it's just part of our healing to accept everything that we did as children because we were children. I see so many people blaming themselves who are nine years old and didn't do something for their parent or their brother or whatever. You were nine years old. Like, what do you expect? If you see a little nine-year-old playing in the, in the schoolyard, and I do this because I got a schoolyard about three blocks from me. I just imagine how many of those kids are going through trauma right now? Probably quite a few. And if I saw that kid and that kid said, you know, I hit my brother the other day or whatever, or I pushed him down the stairs, whatever. Can you just look at that kid and go, well, you're nine years old, nine years old, nine year olds do weird things because your brain hasn't formed yet. So there's nothing left out. Everything you thought said or did is welcome to me. And it remains there in your eyes. And I'll talk about that more as we get down further in the lyrics. It remains there. I can see it in your eyes. I can accept it in your eyes. I can see in my mind's eye, I look, I can look at you as a child, which is me as a child and accept everything you thought, said, or did. Whatever comes and goes. That's what he says next. Whatever comes and goes, I accept it. And then he said, I will hear your silent call. So he's making an intention to go back and find that child, I will hear your silent call. And it is silent because a lot of times we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear that child's pain. We'd rather, you know, go into addictions, do something, anything that avoids hearing that child's call. But when we do that, when we stuff it down, we stuff it down, we stuff it down, we create more alarm because that child now feels even more abandoned than they, than they did at the time that it was happening. And then after I will hear your silent call, he says, and I will touch this tender wall. I will make that connection with this younger version of myself. 
that was hurting. And it is a tender wall. And it is something that we can reach. Now, I get emotional about this because this is, this is really such a key part of my own healing that I've kind of avoided telling you about for a long time because it is so vulnerable and so personal to me. But it works. And my commitment to you is to give you the absolute best strategies to help you heal. And I will touch this tender wall. I will make this connection with this younger version of myself that's still hurting. Till I know I'm home again. And that's really about what it comes down to is coming home again. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as I go through the lyrics. Now, in, in the recorded version, the song starts here. But that's why I like the live version because he says at the start of it, accepting all I've done and said, I want to stand and stare again till there's nothing left out. It remains there in your eyes. Whatever comes and goes, I will hear your silent call and I will touch this tender wall till I know I'm home again. That's why I like the live version. So the recorded version starts, love, I get so lost sometimes. And really, I think he's talking to his child. It's like, I get so lost sometimes in my adult world, in this place that I have to be this, for Peter Gabriel, I guess it's this singing star. But we all have that. You know, we all have this image that we present to the world. And it's an adaptive image, especially if you had trauma when you were younger. We create this adaptive image. And I think accepting that we had to make that, we had to manipulate, we had to lie, we had to be sexually promiscuous, whatever your, your thing is, whatever my patients or anxiety peeps have told me that they've done, that they've been ashamed of as children. Like whatever you had to do, you did because you weren't getting your needs met. So I see this a lot with women who started having sex very early in their, in their lives. Such shame, they feel such shame and stuff. It's like, well, you weren't getting your needs met any other way. Can you understand that this was a way that you might felt might have felt connected or might have felt some love or some attention? And that really helps a lot of people. So there's a lot of things that we do when we're younger that we do out of reaction because we weren't getting our needs met. And what we're trying to do and what I try and do in this song is I try and give Rusty, the younger version of me, the love, care, and attention and protection that he didn't get back then, back when he was a 12-year-old or an 8-year-old. I make the intention that I'm going to connect with him. So, love, I get so lost sometimes. Days pass and this emptiness fills my heart. Now, I, this reminds me so much of my younger life. You know, people thought I had it all together. I was good at sports. I was this young doctor. I did stand-up comedy. I was a yoga teacher. But days would pass when I'd be just crippled with anxiety. I was very good at hiding it. I was very good at hiding it with accomplishments in a lot of ways. But I was lost. I was always I was looking for external validation. And that's another podcast about Dr. Kennedy's search for external validation. But days would pass. And this emptiness would fill my heart. For me, it's a little lower. It was in my solar plexus. I felt this emptiness, this hollowness, this pain, which I have come to know as alarm now from my little LSD experience. But days would pass, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, with this hollowness, this emptiness filling my heart. When I want to run away, this is next lyric, when I want to run away, I drive off in my car which I think is a metaphor for dissociation. So when it's too much, when the emotion's too much, when the alarm is building up, we don't know where it comes from, the alarm is building up, we need to get away. So we dissociate. We go up into our heads. We don't feel so much anymore. And this is the point where we separate from our spouse, our children, our parents, whatever. We separate at that point. We dissociate because it's just too painful to stay in that child's body because when the pain occurred... We were just children. We didn't have any power in our lives, really. 
and if we were being abused somehow or life wasn't very good, it's very difficult to kind of connect with that part of us. But that's exactly what we have to do. We have to, to, to come back from dissociation, to bring ourselves back into the present moment. And when we bring ourselves back in the present moment, we're no longer so affected by our past trauma or our future projections of worry, warnings, what ifs, worst case scenarios. We're in the present. And that's one of the reasons why I love sensation. That's why I say the ABCs, awareness is the first step when you realize you're in anxiety or alarm then B, body and breath, go into sensation because that brings you into the present moment. And then C is creating this compassionate connection with yourself. So the next thing he says is, but whichever way I go, I come back to the place you are. So we can't run away from the child. We can't run away from the pain that that child carries. We always come back. Now, if we can come back in a loving, caring, protective way, that's much more healthy for us and our psyche than coming back and dissociating and coming back again into the pain and dissociating, which is what I think most of us do when we don't know what to do, when we're in therapies that are more cognitive. Again, I don't have anything against cognitive therapies, but if you're not doing this, if you're not connecting with your younger child, you're not going to heal. It's just what I've seen. But whichever way I go, I come back to the place you are. So we can't escape the pain. And when I come back to the place that you are, when I come back to the child, all my instincts, they return. So all, our, all of what we are, love, peace, contentment, whatever, whatever it is, all the instincts, they return. The grand facade, the, the image we're putting out to the world, the lyric is, the grand facade so soon will burn. When we are connected to that younger version of ourselves, we don't need external validation. We don't need so much from the outside. And I can tell you this from my own, from my own life is that for the first 50 years of my life, I was a stand-up comic. I would, it's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. And the reason before that, and I've talked about that before, is my father was mentally ill. My brother had some orthopedic issues. So I felt like I didn't really get that much attention when I was young because all the attention from my mother went to my brother who was often, you know, sick with orthopedic stuff or my dad who was just psychotic, crazy. So there is a real drive in me to be seen. So now what I do is I see Rusty. I see the child in me. I give him what he needs and I don't need it so much from the outside. And I'm just so much more balanced and I just go so much more slowly. So, the grand facade so soon will burn. So when you are connected with that younger version of yourself, you don't need to project out all this dysfunction because you're giving it to yourself. And as cliche as that sounds, it works. It really works. Now, this is not to say that you don't need it from the outside. We need love from the outside. But we do create this facade as children where if, we're, if we have trauma where we start learning how to adapt to the trauma. We learn how to be manipulative or promiscuous or whatever it is. We learn how to get our needs met. And if we don't get our needs met in a loving, caring, attuned, attached way, we will find <laughs> maladaptive ways of getting our needs met. So the grand facade drops. We become more of our authentic self. And then he says, without a noise, without my pride. So we don't hear this. You know, when we connect with our inner selves, it's very quiet. And when you look in the eyes of your younger self, if you have a picture on your phone like I do, or just a, a basic picture, without a noise, like you are present with that child, even if it's painful. And then he says, without my pride, which is one of my favorite lyrics in this whole song, because pride is ego and ego is there to protect you. So ego is one of the th reasons why we don't go back and get that child because ego says, well, that child hurt us and we don't want to go back and be that child because that child was, was bullied. That child was shamed. We don't want to be that child. So ego prevents us through our body and through our mind from going back and being with that child. So when he says, without a noise, without my pride, he's dropping his ego. He's dropping that need for protection and saying, look, 
I see you, I hear you, I love you, and I'll protect you. I reach out from the inside, which is a double metaphor, which is the child reaches out for me, Rusty reaches out for me, and I reach out for him. So we're reaching out from the inside. Such a great lyric. In your eyes, the light, the heat. So the light is our divinity. The light is the spark of who we are, our authentic selves. The heat is the alarm. The heat is our reactive self that had to be a certain way to survive, or at least perceive that we were going to survive. So the light is in all of us. And the heat, the alarm is also in all of us too. And the alarm can override the light. And that's when we get into anxiety, depression, all these horrible things that happen to us. The light, the heat, I am complete in your eyes. So at that point, when you do connect with the younger self, you're complete. This child that's been asking your asking for your attention for so long sees that you're now finally going back, picking them up from the store, wherever, picking them up and saying, I am complete. You, you complete me. I can't get over the Dr. Evil things these days. You complete me. So it is this sense of completion. And I can vouch for this because there is this, there, there's sometimes that I, I listen to this song and I look at myself in the morning and it's like, I'm not quite there. I'm a little dissociated or whatever. But there's other times where it's really intense and it's really powerful. And that's what I, I want to share with you is like this practice is really, really helpful. So I see the doorway to a thousand churches which is basically saying, I see your divinity. I see the spark of the divine in you, the spark of consciousness. I see that in you, that you are just a child, but in that innocent child is love. It's everything. Like you are, you are everything to me. You contain the best parts of me. Even the parts that I pushed away, like my sensitivity, you know, as a boy, you know, up until I was about five or six, I would cry when I was hurt, which didn't go well on the playground. <laughs> tell you that much. So there's a part of me that, that judges that boy because he got hurt. So it's one of those things where if you get hurt as a child, you go, well, I'm never doing that again. And that's ego. That's ego. It'll go in there and it'll say, look, we're never doing that again. So it's going back and kind of, as he starts this whole thing, whatever I've done or said, I accept all of it. So when he says, I see the doorway to a thousand churches, I read that as I see my divinity. I see my wholeness. I see my completeness. And the resolution, like the child's been yelling through this alarm in our body for years. For me, it was like three decades, four decades of yelling through the alarm, through this solar plexus area, through the alarm in my body. The child is yelling at me like, see me, hear me, love me, protect me. And I'm like, no, I'm not feeling this. I'm going to go have a drink or I'm going to go on antidepressants or whatever. You got to feel it to heal it. You got to bring that kid back. You've got to find them. And it, and that's where the resolution comes. That's where you resolve your anxiety. The single biggest thing that has helped my crippling anxiety has been the resolution of this judging, abandoning, blaming, and shaming of that little boy in me who experienced a lot of trauma. So as I bring him back into connection, loving connection, it's a resolution. Like he doesn't need to sound the alarm so much anymore. And, and I can tell you that's actually happened. The alarm is still there. I still wake up with it most days, but it doesn't bother me so much anymore. It's like, oh, that's you. Okay. What do you need? It's like, well, you've got a lot of things. You've got too many things. This is what he says to me. It's like, you have, you have too many things going today, which is true. A lot of the time it's like, okay, what if I get rid of this? And, and, and you and I, and I said, you and I will always be together. We will, I say this to him all the time. You will, not, we can never be apart. I will never judge you again. We will, we will always be together. So today, what I'll try and do is give us some time where we're not booked back to back and he'll say okay at least in my mind he does so the resolution of all the fruitless searches that's the next one the resolution of all the fruitless searches so everything we look for outside of ourselves and i'm guilty of this for sure 
looking for validation, uh, looking for recognition, just attention that I didn't get when everything went to my brother and, and, and my father. So the resolution of that, of all the fruitless searches, of looking outside of me for something that I think is going to fulfill me, that something that is going to, to complete me, you know, and it never did. I mean, I remember getting my med school degree, which I worked for for 10 years. I remember that parchment paper hitting my hand. I remember the feeling of it. I still do right now. And as soon as that parchment paper hit my hand and they do this little thing where they tap your shoulder and they say, admit Ote, which means that, okay, you're one of the gang now. You're one of the do doctors. As soon as that parchment paper hit my hand, it was like, okay, what's next? What's next? And that, that was a real turning point for me because it's like, hey, you've been working on this for 10 years and this is all you get? So I've never really been good at rewarding myself. I'm much, much better now because I'm learning how to connect with myself. But it's just an example as my microphone starts to fade, fall down. It's just an example of how we just discount the good stuff and just focus on the bad, which is... You know, we have a fear bias in our brain. Absolutely. We will pay more attention to things that are scary than things that are pleasurable because we're designed that way. If we didn't, we'd be dead because, because we would ignore things that are scary. So it, our evolution, our brains have this fear bias that says, look, if something pops up that you're not used to in the savannah, that's something to pay attention to dude. I don't know if they said dude 60,000 years ago. Probably not. But can you see that, that you need that connection with your younger self and that looking for it outside of yourself in a new job, a new partner, a new car, whatever, it's just this fruitless search. Not that everything is like kumbaya, you know, you have to connect with yourself. You can't love anyone else unless you love yourself. I'm not saying that. That may be true, but I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you really have to look at what are the fruitless searches in your life? What are you what are you trying to get? What's your inauthentic self, your reactive self that you had to develop as a child? What is that doing in your life that's probably making you unhappy? Because like I said, I get this medical degree and within a second, I was like, okay, that was good. What do I do now? I want to see the light and heat in your eyes. So I want to see the light. I want to see my authentic self. That's the light. That's the divinity that's in all of us. That's the power that's in every single one of us that often we lose. When you grow up and you have trauma that's unresolved, that feeling that the world is a safe place and that you have a power in you that's, that's deep and profound, we lose that. And then we start thinking that we have to to rely on our academic self without any spirit, without anything else. As a child, I had, to, I had to feel like I was in control at 12 years old. So I looked after my mom. I looked after my dad. But I knew I was 12. I knew I was in, in way over my head. And I lost that feeling that there is something looking after me. There is a power greater than myself. And if you look at people who have have sp spontaneous healing from cancers or from, uh, from MS, they all say the same thing. They all say, I know there's a power in me that is stronger than what I perceive. And that's very true with anxious people. Anxious people, and I've talked about this before on my Instagram page, anxious people overestimate threat and they underestimate their ability to deal with it. And if you struggle with anxiety, I can guarantee you, you've overcome some major things in your life. And it's funny how when, when the shit hits the fan, like when I used to work a merge, be a merge doc, and s stuff would come in, I just became this very cool, directed, this is what's going to happen. You know, I would panic before that. Like, what if I get a car accident? What if I get a child? What if I get this? What if I get that? I would panic before that. But when it actually happened, man, I was good. I was good. I was like solid in there. So I see the light and heat in your eyes. I see the light. I see the divinity. I also see the alarm. I also see the heat. And I want both. I want to help you with the heat. You don't, child, rusty, you don't have to carry the heat alone anymore. 
which was it took me a long time to reach him. You know, probably about three years altogether. Now, now I know what to do. People reach their inner child or younger self or whatever you want to call it a lot sooner. And this is one of the this is one of the processes I use to help people find find that. So I, I, I see the light and heat in your eyes. So I see the divinity. I see the pain. I want to be that complete. I want to be able to relish both. I want to be able to relish your authentic self. And I also want to be able to relish that pain and just show you that I will take it. The adult in me will take it. I will look after you. I will see you. I will heal you. I will love you. I will protect you from this pain. And you can release it to me. Because at the time this happened, you probably didn't tell anyone. There probably wasn't anybody to tell when you're traumatized. So you can tell me now. And I say that to him. It's like, you can tell me what was painful. And there was a time that he said, well, it was really difficult to see my father in pick psychiatric intensive care on the floor, basically naked, like just screaming in emotional pain. And just talking about that right now, it just chokes me up. So I, I told him, it's like, yeah, that was, that was something you shouldn't have seen as a 15 year old. That was something that was just too much for you. Now I've used that image a number of times and I've, a lot of the charges come off that image because I've worked on it a number of times and I've shown my 15 year old self who wasn't rusty so much anymore. I think rusty got lost around, you know, well, maybe grade 10. I've shown him that, that that was a painful image, but he's not alone there anymore. He doesn't have to fix that. That was one of the things about my dad that was really difficult because I knew I couldn't fix him. One of the reasons I became a doctor was I had a father who I couldn't fix. I couldn't help. So I want to help everyone else, which is still part of my personality. And I do believe that is part of my authentic self. It really is part of my authentic self. But I took it too far. I burned out. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't help every baby bird that was hurt. And that crushed me. It was hard. Plus, it was really hard handing out medications to people when I could see that they were in deep pain and the, you know, what they were suffering from was a result of emotional trauma that was unhealed. And all the acid blockers for your stomach in the world, all the Zoloft, all the Prozac, all the Ativan wasn't going to heal that. And it's hard to be in that job as a medical doctor when you know you're just putting a blanket on stuff. And there's, there, there is a benefit to putting a blanket on stuff too. But one of the things, I'm rambling a bit in this podcast, but one of the things that I would find with antidepressants that would, would disappoint me is that people would have these wounds that I think that they could probably heal if, if they did the work. But once they started taking the antidepressant and the pain was gone, there was no desire whatsoever to go back and find that child and find their eyes. So sometimes I would get very disappointed <laughs> when the antidepressants work because I knew that person could probably work through that without them. And again, that's another podcast. So I want to touch the light, the heat I see in your eyes. Basically the same. I want to touch the alarm. I want to touch the divinity. I want to touch the best parts, the worst parts. You can give it all to me. And then he says, love, I don't like to see so much pain. So when he's addressing the alarm specifically, and he goes into it and he looks in his eyes and says, love, because he's talking to him, his, his younger self, I don't like to see so much pain. And I think that's true with all of us, with our kids, with ourselves. We don't like to see the pain. It's hard. So much wasted. And this moment keeps slipping away. That's his next lyric. So much wasted. And this moment keeps slipping away. The only way we heal is in the present moment. We can't heal when we're, we're ruminating about the future or we're stuck in our past traumas. And what trauma does to us, what the alarm does to us, is it continually fires our thoughts into the future about worries and it fires us into feelings of the past. There's a part of our brain called the insula. And the insula, I believe, carries the bodily representation of our trauma. And I believe that we feel exactly the same now as we did back then when the trauma was occurring. And then we get the same helpless feeling at the same time. So if we can, if we can see that pain, if we can embrace that pain and allow that pain to be there and even relish the pain, and I've talked before about being grateful for the pain, we start taking control of that 
as opposed to the alarm controlling us, immediately firing us into our thoughts. And then when we get in our thoughts, the thoughts fire up the alarm, the alarm fires up the thoughts, and we're in this alarm anxiety cycle that we just can't get out of until we realize that that's what we're in. So much wasted. And this moment keeps up. I thought that, I, you know, I look back at my life and I think, it seems like I wasted 40 years because a lot of time I was in alarm, I was in dissociation, I wasn't enjoying my life. Even on trips that I've, I've been on, wonderful trips, Croatia, South Africa, I remember just being riddled with alarm when I was away. So much wasted, so much wasted. And part of what allows me to sort of keep going and cope is, is that I use that pain to help you, to help other people. Like that's, that's what I do. That's why I've been put on this earth is to help other people with the pain. So sometimes when I have this pain and I still go through alarm these days, it's like, where's the lesson in this that I can talk about on the podcast (laughs) or I can put a post about because that's how I sublimate. That's how I take the energy of that pain and put it into something productive because with my dad, I never could, you know, my dad, it was always a source of pain. So it was really hard. (sighs) So much wasted. Yeah. I get so tired working so hard for our survival. Now that could go both ways. The child is working very hard for his own survival or her own survival. And the adult is also working very hard for their survival, exactly because we're split from each other. Now, if if we embrace that child, if we were connected to that child, we wouldn't be in survival mode so often. Now, anxiety is a part of life. Anxiety, we will never get rid of. There's always going to be something that we're anxious about or fearful about. But when we're connected to ourselves, when we allow that alarm to be there, when we know that alarm is our younger self and that we can connect with it and we have some agency in it, we're not that helpless, powerless 12-year-old anymore. There is this sense that, okay, this is hard, but I can handle it. And then he says, I look to the time with you to keep me awake and alive. So the more I connect with with Rusty, the more I connect with my younger self, even my young adult self, the more I feel like I am awake and alive and in the moment, like I can live in the moment, even if it hurts, even if, even if it hurts, even if the moment is painful, I can live in it now. I can be grateful for the pain because the pain is the marker of my younger self. It's a conduit to the child in me. So if I see my alarm as a way of connecting with my younger self, as a way of resolving this whole fucking mess of anxiety and alarm I've lived with for, you know, 50 years or 40 years. It makes sense to me. And I also feel like I have some power over the situation because when I was a child and my dad would, you know, become manic or depressed or psychotic, I had no power. And a lot of us were like that when we, when we had trauma as children, we were powerless The only place we had to go was our head. That was the only place we could go was go into our head, dissociate. And that was the only piece. And I put peace in quotation marks for for those of you listening on the on the podcast audio. That was the only piece we had. Was and so we learned, we taught ourselves, we literally conditioned ourselves to overthink because that was the only safe place. But now we're adults, we have more power in the situation we have the ability to go back and find that child because that child, because the amygdala who recorded or what recorded all that negativity has no sense of time. When we go through a similar trauma today, we are transported back to that that time when we were six years old or 12 years old or whatever. So we're living as a child and we have the same resources as a child when we're in that deep alarm. So of course, we can't heal ourselves. So awareness breath, body and breath, and compassion for yourself. Find that child. Instead of going into your head and ruminating and trying to find 5,000 different worries that are going to solve your problem that only just create more problem, take that time and go, I'm going to look in your eyes. I'm going to look in that child. I'm going to, at, at the very least, find the alarm in your body and put your hand over it and connect to it because that alarm is your younger child. That is your younger self. So I look to the time with you to keep me awake and alive. Keep me in the present moment. And when I'm like that, all my instincts, they return. My, my authentic self returns. My, my sense of peace returns. Now, your sense of peace can return and you can still be fucking alarmed. But you are now changing a step in the dance. 
you are now no longer a helpless victim to this alarm. You have the instinct of connecting with your younger self that is love, that is contentment, that is fun, that is playful. You can connect with that and you have that choice rather than getting the alarm and then immediately going into your thoughts and worrying because that's a trap you will never get out of. And all my instincts, they return. The grand facade, the part of me that I project to the world, so soon will burn. I don't need that inauthentic self anymore. I don't need that reactive self. And one of the reasons I'm making this, and it's so personal to me, is I have this facade, and we're trained this as, a medic, as, a, as, a medical, as medical doctors, to be this dispassionate, kind of in-control entities. And it's not the way I am. It's not, it's not my authentic self. My authentic self is to have loose, bound, <laughs> loose boundaries because that's the way I was raised and have this, try and get this connection from other people. That's kind of my instinct. So without a noise, without my pride, without ego, without this bluster of, you know, Dr. Russ, the author and the yoga teacher and all that kind of stuff, who am I? Like I am... A boy saying in front of a girl. No, that's from another movie. I am a person, an adult, who is now cultivating a specific relationship with that wounded boy in me. That's who I am. And accepting, at, at the very start of this, it was accept, accepting all I've said and done. Accepting all of it. Embracing all of it. And seeing in your eyes, in his eyes, that he has the light, the peace, he has everything. We just have to go in there and find it with him. So without a noise, without my pride, I reach out from the inside, which I love that lyric because that's basically what it is. I'm reaching out to myself. So I have to be on the inside. And both of us are reaching out. So Rusty's reaching out to me and I'm reaching out to him. So without a noise, without my ego, without all my protection, like, you know, what's this going to look like? Am I presenting too much of my life here, you know, without my ego, can I present this? It's like, yeah, I can. Now, six months ago, maybe I couldn't. I reach out from the inside. So that's what I'm asking you to do. When you get up, put this on, find a picture of yourself when you're younger and look at it and listen with these lyrics in mind. And if you have any revelations Send me a DM on Instagram at the anxiety MD because I'm always looking for more, something more I can chew on about this song because I'm always finding more stuff. And it's such a touching song if you listen to it the right way. If you, if you use it to connect with yourself, to connect with the younger version of yourself, you actually do reach out from the inside. And excuse me, when you connect with that younger, version of yourself that's when you heal that's i see the doorway i see the i see the path to healing and for me isn't all of it but it's a huge part of it a huge part of it is every morning connecting with him before i get up before i get in the shower before i do anything it's just listening to this song and like i said One version is 11 and 34. That's the live version. That's the version I recommend you start with. And then after a while, because I've done this so many times and I can connect with that feeling just from hearing the introduction to the song is I can play the shorter version. If If I have to get out of bed quickly, I will play the shorter version. But I would start with the longer version because it's very moving and it's very touching. And if you see it as your own self and you have a picture of yourself, At the same time, you can just use a mental picture too. Like you can find your own eyes in your mind's eye as you listen to this song with your eyes closed. There's a bunch of different ways of doing this. So this is important. This is how you truly heal from anxiety and alarm rather than just cope with it. Because it's the child in you that's alarmed. And if you can go back and show them that they are seen, heard, loved, and protected, and no longer judged, abandoned, blamed, and shame, you can really take a giant step towards your healing. So I'll see you next time.